Good evening and happy holidays. I'm, uh, I'm Mark Uptegrove, the director of the LBJ Library. And on behalf of my friend Bill Stotesbury, the executive director of KLRU, I want to welcome you here tonight. Now, for the friends of the LBJ Library in the audience, you know that we began this year's programming with a wonderful session that united for the first time four chief White House photographers who shared their memories of their time in the White House and some of the work that they produced during that time. One of those photographers was David Valdez, who is with us here again tonight. Um, at that time, when we did that program, there was a documentary that was being shot called The, the President's Photographer by National Geographic. Uh, and the executive producer of that, that program is a friend of mine named John Bradar. And John is our special guest tonight. And we will be seeing his film, The President's Photographer. John was kind enough to autograph some of the copies of the companion book that he authored on The President's Photographer as well. We're going to air the documentary and then John and David and I are going to sit down in a discussion afterwards to talk about the film and take some of your questions. Now, for those of you who aren't friends of the LBJ Library, we invite you to be friends of the LBJ Library. And there's literature outside. And we'd love you to come back to enjoy some of the wonderful programming that we've had here, uh, that we have here all year round. So thank you for coming. It's now my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Bill Stotesbury. On behalf of all of us at KLRU, I want to thank Mark and everybody here at the LBJ Library for the opportunity to be a part of this evening. Um, this is such a great facility and such a wonderful group of people who are part of this institution, and we're very fortunate to have a partnership with them uh, the tonight and, and on other evenings. KLRU and PBS is about telling stories. Uh, it's about letting you into places that you might not be able to get into otherwise. And tonight, we have an opportunity for unprecedented an unprecedented look at the visual historians of the presidency, the individuals who have been given unprecedented access and in whom an incredible trust has been given to allow them the access to shoot hundreds and thousands of photographs over the course of a presidential term or terms and bring that story of the presidency into vivid visual display for all of us to enjoy. Uh, John's book and documentary is a wonderful piece of work which we aired uh, last November and will air again just after the first of the year. Check your local listings. And uh, it allows us to learn about the very few individuals who have been trusted with this unique position and this unique access. Uh, a close look through the words and through the eyes of the individuals who have established themselves as paramount among their professional peers and colleagues by virtue not only of their incredible eye for composition, but also of their ability to take on the mantle of trust and integrity that has to distinguish an individual in this position. And so, without further delay, we invite you to enjoy presidential photographer, 50 years in the Oval Office. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome John Bradar and David Valdez. Well, John, congratulations. It's a great film. Thank you very much. Uh, you recently previewed it for an interesting audience. Can you talk about uh, your experience yeah. showing this to President Obama in, at the White House? We were, uh, we were lucky enough a week ago Monday to uh, screen it that kind of garish uh, room you saw them wearing the 3D glasses in, that's the White House screening room, which was really fantastic. So um, yeah, it was a huge honor to be able to, um, to sit there 
you know, a couple rows behind the president. As Pete says, uh, President Obama has a very recognizable head from behind. And, uh, and I got familiar with that. And at one point, I, I remember early in the movie watching and thinking, you know, I'm looking at the silhouette of the president's head, and it's silhouetted against our movie, which I was, you know, kind of stunned with. So it was really, it was fantastic. They're very warm. And, you know, as all the presidents have been in, um, in our opportunity to meet them, they've, you know, uniformly cordial people. And I, actually, the thing that I would say that's so interesting about meeting them in person is it's the same effect that the photographers achieve, which is they humanize them. You know, um, we have such a, I think, somewhat distorted idea of who our leaders are. You know, they're either the devil incarnate or a superhero. And they're neither, they're humans. You know, and what you see in these photographs, and, and you know, David can speak to this better than I, is their fathers, their sons, their husbands, um, their people. What was the impetus of the film? Well, it grew out of um, a film that I had done in the 1990s called Inside the White House, which was, which was kind of a history of the White House. And, um, you know, as we were editing that film, I kept seeing this guy show up in all our shots. And it turned out to be Bob McNeely, who was the Clinton's photographer. And I realized, you know, he, he literally was a shadow on, on President Clinton. And I thought, well, what a perspective that guy must have. I never had really thought about a presidential photographer prior to that. And um, so kind of sat on that idea for a long time. And you know, when this presidency kind of came about, we thought, oh, this, this is a great opportunity. Well, you, you serve not only as executive producer on the film, but as author of the companion book. Talk about both of those projects and how you tried to capture the subject through those different mediums. Well, I mean, first of all, I'd say I felt just super lucky to be able to you know, muck around in that story because I love the White House, I love American history, and I love, you know, the opportunity to tell stories about it. And, you know, I'm really a documentary filmmaker. I'd never written a book before. And if there was ever a, a kind of lack in making a film, it's that you couldn't go deep enough. You know, that's not what the medium's really designed for. And so here I had a chance with a book to tell much more of the history, to provide a lot more of the context. And when I got done with the book, I realized that when you put them side by side, you can do that history, you can do that depth, you can do that context in a book, but you can't convey as much emotion. So there are instances, for example, when President Obama tells that story about you know, tipping his head down for the boy to, to touch, um, that's in the book, but come on, there's no way to compare the, the kind of impact it has when he's actually delivering that story to you. Right. So there's something about film that works really great as film. There's something about a book that does the same in that particular medium. And I was so happy to be able to have both because I think combined, they deliver this um, wonderful kind of satisfying experience, at least for me. I don't know about you guys. David. What, what comes into your mind when you see that film? Harkening back to your own experience, do you get wistful, do you get exhausted? What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, it certainly brings back a lot of memories. Uh, you could have taken any one of the presidential photographers and plucked them in there and had a very similar type experience. Um, uh, back in my day, we were shooting film, so we didn't shoot as much, um, uh, but, but uh, there are a lot of memories uh, that harken back to the, the friendships that you develop because you get into a situation, and Pete and the president talked about that a little bit with their relationship, and, and um, because you do spend so much time with the president and the president's family, there, you, you do become a part of the family, and uh, I know with President Bush, we lived through so many things, and, and the birth of some of the grandchildren, and the death of his mother, and, and then the fall of the Berlin Wall, and, and so many just incredible things that went on during the time that I was there. So, so your, your relationship becomes really good, but we would go in to meet with the, the Pope or King Hussein or somebody, and he'd hit me on the elbow and, and say, can you believe 
two guys from Texas doing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, one person from Texas who's in the audience has had a very uh, intimate glimpse of, of the White House, and that's Lucy Johnson. But there are very few people who have, outside of family, who get as, as intimate a glimpse uh, of, of presence as you do. And we saw that in the film. When is it time to put your camera down? What are those instances where you say, gosh, this is just too personal a moment. Uh, I, I don't want to capture this. I want to be respectful. Talk about that line. The, you, you know, you, you did it so much. And, and for me, uh, probably the, the, the one time that we actually had a conversation about it uh, is when he was a vice president. And uh, President Reagan sent the vice president down to Florida to meet with the families uh, uh, from the space shuttle Columbia that blew up. And we were, I, I went down and uh, with the vice president and we were walking down the hallway in this building and I said, what do you think? And, and he didn't really respond, but you could tell that, that it, it was one of those one moment where cut it some slack. And, and so, but beyond that, um, it was, it was never ending. I, I mean, even on his last day as president, when he, I was expecting him to come over to the Oval Office and he stayed in bed. And so I was kind of looking around for him and I went up into the, uh, residence of the White House and went into his bedroom and there he was in bed reading the LA Times and I took one of my last photos that morning of him and and so never once uh, did we really stop except that one time now at the very beginning I took a photo of, of uh, President Bush with one of his grandchildren and Barbara Bush enjoyed the photo so much she wrote me a little note saying, if you take pictures of my grandchildren, you can go anywhere and do anything you want to do. <laughs> so I kept that note handy for quite a few years. <laughs> you know, the, there's something about that, that that I find really interesting, which is um, you know, prior to LBJ, there wasn't that kind of coverage. I mean, there's a little bit with, with Kennedy, but Kennedy had uh, what his photographer referred to as a two-click rule which is after he heard the second click, you were waved out of the room. And so that kind of documentary photography tradition, we really owe to President Johnson. We'll, t we'll talk about that, John. We, when we had the four photographers I talked, spoke to you about earlier, including David, uh, Okamoto, LBJ's photographer, was openly acknowledged as the, the godfather of White House photography. Why is he so important? He set so many different... Um, standards, not just in terms of the standard of coverage, um, but also, you know, for example, today I was working with one of your researchers and we were going through some, um, some old memos of Okamoto's. Um, I'm kind of obsessed with Okamoto. Um, and he's laying out um, precedent that all of his uh, successors will benefit from. I want to be on Air Force One. I want to be in this place. I want to have access here. And you know, as Mike Geisinger, who was on his staff, says in the film, um, he reported only to the president. And um, in fact, I found an Okamoto uh, slideshow audio soundtrack where he talked about being one of two people in the entire administration who could walk into the Oval Office whenever he wanted to. Yeah. And I think it's that kind of freedom that, and invisibility, really. He, he kind of talked at length about how he um, was trying to become like furniture, and uh, which I think, well, I find, to me, one of the most delightful aspects that all of the photographers have, which is this strong desire to be ignored, which is so contrary <laughs> to where this society is right now. One of the, David Kennerly, who was in the film and is a good friend of, of uh, this library um, had a great quote that you, you talked about earlier. Do you want to talk about his being the worst source in oh, Washington? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> David. He, well, and Pete actually referenced it. He says that when he was gaining the trust of the president as a senator, he never talked about what he heard in the room. 
He never even told the reporter he might have been working with what he heard in the room. And Kennerly and everybody, who's the, most of these guys have worked as photojournalists prior to taking the job, and then continuing afterwards, they follow this unwritten rule, which is you do not talk about what you hear in there. And Kennerly is very proud of the fact that he says, you know, in fact, when I die, um, you know, I, I, I want my tombstone to read, here lies the worst source in Washington. <laughs> David, uh, it was not only you working behind the lens in the White House. You had a staff. Yeah, thanks. And, but you have the best job in the world because you can choose the assignments that, that you, you pursue and you can, you can uh, assign other photographers to do other things. When did you not choose to cover the president? Well, you're on, jo on the job seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And Pete talked about uh, family and friends. Well, you do need to take uh, a little breather because even when the president would go on vacation, you would go on vacation with him because he's still president. And, and so you, you, I, I, the way I did it, and I, I think some of the other guys did, because, you, you know, I, I always followed kind of the David Kennerly uh, rule of just, you know, cover everything. And, and, and be on Air Force One, be on Marine One, be in the motorcade, many times in the spare limo, more times in, in the support van, a car two back, but, but you were always there. It was, you were always considered, um, uh, it, it, it was like you weren't considered because everybody knew that you were gonna be there. And now, now you wanted to switch out and take a breather I had Susan Biddle and Carol Powers who worked with me on my staff and and uh, I always thought that they were probably better photographers than I was but I was I was chosen to be the, the head guy and um, the day that the um, uh, Iraq war started I was called up to the Oval Office and, and I had divvied up the schedule morning, midday and evening between the three of us and, and that day, I got a call to come to the Oval Office. And you, you would always know, well, you're gonna go photograph something. Uh, but that day, they just said, just come to the Oval Office. Well, that particular day, at that particular time, I wasn't self-scheduled to do that. But I went because they called me and asked me to go. And I get up there, and I'm out in the front office, and I'm saying, what's going on? And they said, just go into the Oval Office. So I go in, and it's the President and Vice President, uh, Dick Cheney, who was Secretary of Defense, Colin Powell, Chairman of the Joint, St Chief of Joint Chiefs, and um, I realized that the uh, bombing in Baghdad was going to start that day. And you talk about having access and access being exposed to information, I went in and I photographed the meeting, but then I was going to leave. I, you know, I was in my mind done, but it was so highly classified, I wasn't allowed to leave. So I stayed in the Oval Office and the Oval Office study for many, many, many hours late into the night. And um, uh, the other photographers were like, Where's Dave? Where's Dave? And I'd actually told my wife uh, earlier in the week, I said, one day I'm probably going to disappear and just know that, that you know, this, this is probably it. It's, it's like uh, on 9-11 with Eric, yeah. uh, you know, kind of dropping off the face of the earth for that day uh, while you're doing your job. And... Uh, uh, late into the night that night, uh, in my situation, we were back in the uh, study and the president was calling world leaders because it wasn't the United States alone going to war, it was a coalition. And, and so he was calling all those world leaders. So with Brent Scowcroft and John Sununu, who was chief of staff, uh, there was a lot of photography going on that day for hours and hours on end. and. Uh, uh, the other photographers were st still wondering where I was. 
We'll open it up to questions from the audience, and, and I'll wait while we wait for you to queue up at the mics. I want to ask uh, uh, John, what is your next project for the for, for National Geographic? What do you think I'm doing next? Um, well, we have a bunch of stuff percolating all the time. Um, so I had seven different things ongoing right now. Um, maybe one of the most interesting is about uh, uh, a discovery they made when they brought up the turret of the USS Monitor back in um, 2002, I think it was. They found the skeletons of two sailors. Hmm. And they haven't been able to identify them. And so the story is, who are these people? Who were these sailors? And it's a way to kind of look back at this part of the Civil War and that part of the United States, because what you find is that the, um, the U.S. Navy was made up of a, you know, it really had myriad um, uh, components. Right. Some of the some of the sailors were African American, um, some were Irish immigrants right off the, the boat. Um, so it's it's a, actually a fascinating kind of archaeology forensic story. Hopefully, you'll come back to tell that story. We have questions <laughs> from the audience. Yeah. I have a question for David. Um, when I'm a photographer, so it's all about hardware for me. I'm wondering, as a journalistic photographer, like when you were like in the middle of these meetings and on the run and stuff, did you have um, a favorite go-to lens? And if so, what was that lens? I'm just curious. <laughs> and and also, uh, when you were dealing with film in those days, like. Was there a, were you mostly, just curious at how fast you were shooting most of the time, because you were in so many varied, unpredictable environments and situations, you must have had one that you must have felt most comfortable with. Well, well uh, y you know, in terms of lens, pr probably going wide angle uh, just to show the environment. Uh, but then there were times, you'd go into the Oval Office so much that, Believe it or not, it would get boring, and and so so sometimes I would go in with with a fixed lens to force myself to find another spot in the room to photograph. Um, the one thing that I'm jealous of with in Pete's time uh, is the digital photography um, because Pete was a Pete's able to shoot more available light, where I was shooting a bounce strobe a lot of times. And, and there, there's many shots that Pete has taken that I love uh, uh, with the available light and the light coming through the Oval Office window. And, and you know, we've all done a few of those. But primarily, you know, I was shooting with the bounce flash. So it's a different look. Um, you know, you go back to President Johnson in that time, you know, the guys were shooting high-speed black and white film. During President Reagan's time, there was a switch to color, and, and so I was in that color film era, and you know what it's like shooting color film. We were shooting color negative film um, um, by the caseloads. Uh, I never got on Air Force One with about 400 rolls of film, uh, just because you just never knew. You couldn't say, my card's full. <laughs> Another question, sir. Yeah, I was just wondering, with all the pictures you're taking, there has to be some kind of documentation put on all these photos. And if you're doing hundreds and hundreds a day, who's doing that? Uh, if you're the, the limited person who's in the room, who's going back and saying that photo they were talking about this or that? Well, on a day, on a, on a monthly basis, you've got a monthly schedule, a weekly schedule, and a daily schedule. And the daily schedule was literally minute by minute. And, and then you would make notes if there was a change in there. Uh, Janet Phillips, who was the archivist at the White House, and has been for she's still, she's still there. 20, 30 years. Started during the Reagan administration. Um, uh, she kept, she would take our notes in our, and in my time, our film bags, and because we'd write on there what it was. And it wasn't unusual to shoot, you know, we had a 36 exposure roll of film. It wouldn't be unusual to shoot 10 frames and take the roll of film out because 
the subject matter was changing so dramatically that it's better to just start with a fresh roll of film. Plus, it was easier to keep track of the proof sheet. Uh, you know, these days it's so much better with in the digital world. Um, uh, so I credit everything to to Janet. Janet, she, she's pretty amazing. I mean, I think the one difference is that, um, and Janet would say this. We 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 actually had her in the audience when we uh, screened at National Geographic, but um, it's volume now. There's so much volume. I mean, without the digital capacity to tag different people in the um, shots, she would be just absolutely drowning in, in uh, digital images. But do you actually put any kind of nomenclature in there that this is when something happened or? Yeah, she writes a caption for, for every frame. Thank you. We have time for one more question, Matt. Um, yes, I was wondering when you were first starting your career, did you ever expect to have that happen to you? Like, because I'm a photographer and I'm starting out and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. So, I mean, how did you, you had to be in my place at one point. So, you know, how did it happen? Well, well, I, I got drafted into the military at 18 and they said, you're going to be a photographer. <laughs> and, and I turned to the guy next to me and I said, what is that? <laughs> I was trained as a photographer in the military. Um, I grew up in the era of watching uh, Father Knows Best and Leave it to Beaver. And, and, and I, I grew up watching those television shows and saying, well, when I grow up, I'm going to be a guy in a suit going off to uh, some place to go to work during the day. So I never saw myself at 18, 19 as a photographer, even though that's what I was doing. Now, I, I was in the Air Force, and I was stationed at McDill Air Force Base, and, and the strike command was there, and they ran the, the Vietnam War out of McDill, and, and I was in photographing four-star generals and three-star generals in, in their meetings. So at 18, 19 years old, I was exposed to some pretty high-level stuff. When I got out of the military, uh, four years later, I knew I wanted to finish my degree. Uh, I got a degree in journalism uh, and radio and television production. One semester of that was at the University of Texas, El Paso. Um, um, uh, then I was in Washington, D.C. and wound up working for the federal government as a photographer. And, oh, I don't know, 10 or so years into that, I, um, I went to work for, I was chief photographer for Nation's Business Magazine, which at the time was the largest selling business magazine in the country. And then I heard that Vice President Bush's photographer had left and went to Time Magazine. And um, I said, well, I can apply. And, and, and so I literally did a little research, found out that, that the photographer for the vice president reported to the vice president's press secretary, who was a Texan. I'm a Texan. So I, I wrote this lady, uh, Shirley Green, um, a letter, introduced myself. She called me in for an interview. It was a Texas uh, love fest. Um, a lot of the staff were Texans. Uh, so I got hired as the vice president's photographer. Um, he was uh, elected president. Uh, we were actually going to an event at the National Geographic. It was like the 50th anniversary or 100th anniversary of National Geographic. Yeah, 88. 100. Yeah, and uh, uh, we were, the, we'd gone to the event and we were going back mm -hmm. to the vice president elect's house and um, he asked me to ride in the limo with him and offered me the job as, as president's photographer. And um, I said I was actually kind of holding out for an ambassadorship, <laughs> but that'll do. And, um, and then um, when we lost the re-election in, in 92, um, I was ready to leave Washington, and I, I didn't really know what to do. And I wound up um, 
uh, heading up photography for the Walt Disney Company uh, for eight years. And um, then I was, I was living in Florida and uh, got involved with the George W. Bush campaign as a volunteer. And I knew him from my days way back when. And um, uh, Andy Card, who was the chief of staff for senior President Bush, and uh, Andy was around, and they were during the transition. And I wound up talking about going back and being George W.'s photographer. Um, but my wife said, absolutely <laughs> no way, Be because you do give up your life. And um, uh, so I wound up as a political appointee back in the federal government doing photography and um, just recently moved here uh, to Texas, back home to Texas. And, you and might be the only guy who went from the White House to the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, uh, I, <laughs> I, I promise that would be the last question. But we have in our audience one of the greatest photojournalists of all time in Dirk Halstead, who is at the microphone now and has a question. We'll make that our last question. Dirk? Thank you very much. Uh, two quick observations that I'd like you to comment on. First off, it's a superb documentary. Yeah. Superb. Uh, Thank you very much. And uh, there, um, I know the White House very well. And what you were able to do, and I think the audience will agree, is to give a three-dimensional perspective of what the White House is like. Because after you have seen Pete come from the photo office, up the stairs, up back, around, you get a sense of where everything is in that White House. Uh, and so informationally, I found that fascinating because normally that stuff is done in quick cuts and you don't get to see, okay, how do you get from here to there? And I, I think that really increases the credibility the other thing is your director of photography is absolutely amazing. I, I mean, I am in awe. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, was she using like a beta digital or was she using a small camera? Because she was hauling ass. <laughs> uh, when every time Pete's out of that car, yeah. you see her out of there, and she's beating him uh, where he's going. Uh, can you comment a little bit on that? Sure. Well, she's a he. And, uh, I, I thought Aaron, it was a she. Aaron Harvey, uh, who happens, Aaron. To be David, okay. Good. happens to be David <laughs> Allen Harvey's son, who I'm, is a name I'm sure you're familiar with, a very prominent still photographer who's done a lot of work for National Geographic magazine and others. So Aaron is a phenomenally talented uh, cinematographer and also very light on his feet, as you can see. <laughs> he was shooting with a Panasonic 3000, it's like a chip, you know, a, it's a card camera um, uh, in the P2 family. Um, so it's a full-size camera. He's a fairly big guy. The thing that I like about Aaron as a DP is that he's a really good listener and, um, you know, you, for the type of documentary films that we like to make, where we're trying to give you the experience, we're trying to put you in that environment, just as you pointed out, um, you, you, you don't turn the camera off. You know, you let it roll and you walk. I want, to, I want you to 